Well, hello, everybody. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. Welcome to Brain Club. Okay, so um, today we will be joined by um, Maisie Sotantio, and we're going to be talking about employment. But first, to introduce you to Brain Club. Brain Club is our uh, education program where every week we provide education about All Brains Belong's approach to neuro-inclusive community culture. It's our goal to promote new ways of thinking and being um, in neuro-inclusive space um, because it's then our thought that you go off into the world and that's how systems change happens. This is a place where we hope that you will feel safe, that you can experience neuro-inclusive culture, where we can learn and unlearn together. And although All Brains Belong has a variety of programs that have a variety of purposes, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group or a place to make individualized um, requests. This is a this is an education program and we invite you to explore today's big picture theme and share ideas or reflections related to the topic. All paths to participation are welcome here at Brain Club as always. We welcome you to have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those other neuronormative constructs. So please feel free to walk or move or fidget or stem or eat or take breaks or whatever else needs doing. Um, our, uh, our interview today is pre-recorded. And so most of our time together will be spent with a pre-recorded video. And you're welcome to ask questions or make comments in the chat as we watch. Observation, of course, is a valid form of participation. And in addition to um, uh, affirming all aspects of identity, in order to make this safe for all participants, we prioritize the group's collective needs over that of the individual. And we think a lot about the group's collective access needs. Access needs being anything that is required for full and meaningful participation. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs. And this can be all different types. And so some of the access needs that we like to address up front, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot, dot, dot and choose show subtitles or show transcript. You can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. This is my visual support to make sure that the chat box is open. Um, it's not, as per usual. So now it's open. Now I'll see it. Hello, everybody. Move it out of my way. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, um, today's Brain Club uh, will be a pre-recorded video, an interview with our guest speaker that I'll introduce in just a minute. Um, as we watch, you are welcome to ask questions or comment in the chat about the video. You can use the chat to validate other people's comments or share how something is you know, being shared is impacting you. And then you could also ask questions that our staff will answer. We just ask that if you're gonna use the chat, we ask that you type in the big box, like the main box, instead of using any of the reply threads that helps balance the conflicting access needs of the chat with the chat bouncing up and down if people are responding in threads. So we just ask that you use the big box instead. Um, we are also joined tonight uh, by Cadence on tech support. So if you are having any issues about technology, if you have tech problems or tech questions, we ask that you send a private chat message to Cadence at Tech Support ABB. So you're going to choose Tech Support from the drop down menu so that that can be that Cadence can help you get what you need, and uh, we uh, keep keep it out of the main chats. And sometimes that can um, can go pretty fast and get buried. We don't want your your comment to get buried. Okay, so um, here we go. Um, we've been talking this month about the double empathy problem, a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, uh, who's an autistic social scientist in the UK, who coined this term to describe um, that when there is a mismatch of worldview and communication style um, in either direction, that's where communication breakdowns happen. So we're going to apply that to employment today. What we know is that neurodivergent people 
often struggle with employment. We know that, for example, autistic people are anywhere from two and a half to eight times more likely to be unemployed, regardless of educational status. We also know that ADHDers, 75% um, struggle with employment. And, and, and why is this? Well, most places of employment um, are designed in a one size fits all way. And anyone whose brain works differently than that is othered, thwarted, and worse than that, internalize a narrative that it's their fault. When really it was their access that was denied and thwarted. And so tonight um, we are so excited to uh, welcome asynchronously Nizi Sotanyaki, who is an openly autistic inclusivity trainer, curriculum designer, and employment specialist. She is the founder of Autistic of Autism Career Pathways, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Nizi has worked with autistic individuals and their caregivers for over a decade. Maisie believes that nurturing one's autistic authenticity is a critical first foundation for meaningful self-advocacy, a career path, and living the best life as an autistic person. A little bit more about Autism Career Pathways. Um, autism Career Pathways aims to provide workplace training so autistic and neurodivergent job seekers and employees can thrive and do their best work. As a customized employment specialist, Maisie helps autistic individuals create unique homegrown businesses or find specialized careers that match their strengths. So with that, um, I am going to switch to my other computer. Gotta stop sharing on this one. Start sharing on this one. I will get the motor plan down eventually. Share. Full screen and play. So, Maisie, I would love to just begin. Like, can you tell us a little about yourself and the work you're doing? Sure, sure. My name is Macy Sutantio. I am an openly autistic, um, multiply divergent, late diagnosed adult. And I um, am the founder of a nonprofit in San Francisco Bay Area called Autism Career Pathways. Uh, I have uh, I also started a new platform this year called Guiding Extraordinary Mind or GEMS, where uh, autistic professionals, just autistic people in general, can support each other and support parents of autistic family members uh, on various topics. So my dream would be to have an all autistic led uh, resources for anyone touched by someone um, autistic. Um, and let's see, I um, am also a curriculum designer. So my mind works in bullet points. This is why Mel, you and I get along because you also like bullet points. Um, and I design all kinds of curriculum for parents, for uh, post-secondary educators, for interest-centered career exploration. So this is what my ADHD brain likes to do, just a little bit of everything. Um, and I um, am very passionate to help everyone redefine um, meaningful employment and quality of lives for autistic people needing higher level of support because they are the ones left behind, of course. Um, yeah, I think that that covers everything. <laughs> so, you know, what you're just what you just described, um, though you didn't say it this way, um, your journey has been that of pursuing niche construction, right? So you you just said, you know, I do it this way and I do it this way because this is how my brain works. So you yeah. learned that about yourself eventually right. and you are designing a life in addition to serving other people. Right. You also you're, you're 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 endeavoring to meet your own access needs as you do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so before my diagnosis, uh, it was a lot of trial and errors and um, broken relationships and feeling um, 
very stuck in terms of like, why can't I do things that I could, I could usually do, but some days I wasn't able to do them, you know, and it always, I understand because I also have learning differences. So I have number dyslexia or dyscalculia and reading comprehension is really hard for me. And I don't know how I actually survive going to school at UCLA <laughs> and actually have you know, multiple degrees and my master's degrees as well. Um, but I think I understand how, what autistic students feel when they put like 150% of their efforts and the anxiety is always there. Uh, like that feeling of uh, I've, I'm still falling short or I've, I haven't done enough. Um, and it's I, I totally understand that. So it, I think that having a diagnosis, if you are lucky enough to get a diagnosis, then hopefully that you can find meaning in what does that diagnosis mean to your life and what kind of changes that you can do to protect yourself and also forgive yourself and maybe forgive other people who misunderstood you and uh, help you um, you know, just find peace, right, in everything with your this new knowledge. I came to America when I was 19 years old. So I went when I was little, I moved school at least three times because I struggled reading. I didn't learn to read in a traditional way in the classroom setting. Uh, so my mom had to spend extra time with it, with me and I gave her full credit to eventually help me, you know, crack the reading code or whatever, you know. So uh, when you are a neurodivergent and you live in Asia, you're also gendered a lot of times because for an Asian girl, you should do or not do certain things, right? I really wanted to learn how to ride the bike. I still don't know how to ride a bike and I tried really, really hard. So I would come home like with bloody knees pretty much, you know, throughout the week and for weeks and weeks. And my parents finally said, you know what? It's okay. You don't have to ride a bike. You know, you're a girl, you know, same thing with math. I failed my math like a cross. It doesn't matter. I had a great teacher, I had extra tutoring. My mom helped me after school. I would just, nope, like any kind of numbers in um, math subjects, I would fail them consistently. Um, and my parents would say, that's okay. You're a girl. You don't have to be good at math. You know, those kind of things. Um, although my parents were very, very supportive though. And they didn't bribe me. They didn't punish me. They just accepted like with Macy, that's just how it is. <laughs> she can't read numbers. And, you know, that's, that's okay. You know, so I, I, I'm glad that it was a, a, a positive, my parents supported me. Um, but definitely another example would be like I get sensory overload. I went to a Catholic school. So every Friday we had mass and in a Catholic church, you have to like stand, sit down. And it's just I would go into sensory overload and I, I would pass out like I would get really dizzy, dizzy and, you know, so my teachers knew about this and they would just say, OK, you you just sit. You don't have to stand up and kneel down on the thing. You don't have to do all that. You could just, you know, you, you could just sit over here. Same with uh, outdoor physical activities. Um, then, you know, I, I guess it's good and bad because then you, I was excluded, uh, but it was for my own good. But people just then assume that um, I didn't want to do it or I couldn't do it you know, because they didn't know what else to do. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, I had a ton of stories about that, like blacking out and passing out. Uh, yeah, now and now later, in, late, as, as, as now learning about the constellation of intertwined medical problems that we know that, yeah. you know, the, the overwhelming majority of autistic people have, you know, that's, 
That's your autonomic yeah. nervous system, not handling your Correct. posture changes. That's just, yeah. you know, but people didn't know. People didn't know. And they never would have, you know, just. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so instead you have this narrative of like, you can't do the thing. You can't even like stand oh, and sit. Like, yeah, you know, don't even for, try it. Yeah. Or yeah. And uh, I had physical manifestations. So when I get stressed, I, I always break out. My dad was the same way. I was always itchy. Like, because school was obviously very stressed out. School is hell to my nervous system. So I would come home like with highs. I was always on anti antihistamine growing up. I For still mast break cells. out. Yeah. 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 Mast cell activation. My dad was the same way. My grandma was the same way. So we thought, well, that's just how you just like your dad. <laughs> you know, you're like always itchy or maybe you're allergic to food, this and that. You know, it's not. It's just how my body reacts. To, we yeah. see that in my medical practice a lot. Right. People that are like, oh, my parents, they all have like, no, everybody has this. Yeah. So I didn't like nobody took me for medical care because it was like, oh, that's what happens. Like everybody right. gets hives when they eat crackers. Like, no. Right. No. no, they don't. No, yeah. it's definitely a reaction to stress. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of stress, um, you know, mm -hmm. many people share the experience of, of, of stress growing up and then they become adulthood and or they, they become adults and they're they work. They're trying to get a job and yeah. it is just terrible. Like what's your what's been your experience? Yes. Yeah, so it's well my own personal experience uh my special interest has always been like autism um human communication you know and sports watching uh and i i think i was lucky because i studied psychology and i was able oh, i started working um with autistic kids as a behavioral therapist. I don't know if you know this about me or not. I started 30 years ago because I've been in this field for so long, 30 plus years ago. I came across at UCF LA, the Young Autism Project with the founder of ABA program. So that's how I got started. Uh, I was working also in the classroom for uh, Nordavage preschoolers and many of those students had uh, ABA programs through UCLA, and that's how I got started. And um, OK, there's a point that I was talking about this. OK, so, so I remember the point. I then moved my way up as a, from behavioral therapist to a case manager, supervisor, at, eventually as a clinic supervisor for the largest ABA company in the world. And, and then I hit severe burnout. So if you do, if you are lucky that you're able to have a career based on your specific interests and you're able to move up in your career path, uh, when you hit the, the top, if the, everything crumbles, because for me specifically, I, I, got, I went through sensory burnout because when I work as a clinic supervisor, I had to mask even more. I had to juggle so many different masks. I had to speak on behalf of the clinic owner. And that was very stressful for me. And also managing training and managing people to become therapists for autistic people. That was really stressful for me doing paperwork. Like you have to do um everything a little bit of everything um when you are at the top as or you as you become more successful in your career more and, executive uh, functioning yeah. burdens as yeah. you as increase you demands increase expectations so that's when i got into century burnout where like i was in tears every night like i felt sick you know and it, i i couldn't do it so i laughed i how much of your burnout as an ABA therapist, or how did how did like the nature of the work itself play into this for you, if at all? People ask me this question, oh, did you have a bad experience with ABA? And I always said that I didn't, because at that time, it was it was it was a method that allowed me to work with 
uh, neurodivergent clients. So the work with kids is where that's my passion. Actually, it didn't have anything to do with methods or training or, you know, um, I think after doing uh, behavioral therapy for about 12 years and making it to the top, I realized that uh, it wasn't, it was a very small part of supporting an autistic person to grow up and really feel empowered. Um, and I didn't know how to do that sitting at the table in the closed room with autistic clients. I felt like that was a very tiny, tiny part of the world. And I wanted to learn about other methods. So I, I, I really believe that this is, again, part of my um, autistic side is that I I, I'm a very curious person. So if I learn something, I'll maxed out and then I'm ready to, to get trained again because I believe that there is something better for these human beings, right? So that's why I shifted gear to relationship-based uh, training, similar like floor time. And to me, that made more sense to you learn how to connect and relate uh, and that's the relationship based training is something that I incorporate into all of the curriculum that I design because we we are supporting human beings and it, it's not the background it's not the training it's how you are when you are in the presence of this other human being you have to be human first uh, so I I didn't no one taught me about that. And I had to figure it out, and it's just part of my journey. So, you know, that's no. I mean, so, so it's just it's it's really powerful to hear you say that. Right? And then I just figure out how to become um, an independent consultant. So I've been doing it um, to today. Like, so employment is very tricky if you're neurodivergent. You know, whether you work. Um, in a small business or any size business, really, because you work with other people. And if you're when you're autistic, that social component drains your battery and it's always ever changing, you know. So um, and there are just a lot of misconceptions, misunderstandings about autistic people. Um, it's just hard if you don't know that you're autistic. Yes, um, which is, you know, not surprisingly why, you know, th there's such high rates of, of unemployment, underemployment amongst yeah, autistic correct. people, let alone like, you know, unidentified autistic people. And if you look at like a population of people who are struggling right. with employment, I would imagine that, you know, they're going to find higher rates of, of people being autistic, whether they know it or not. Well, I think it's, I think in general, um, finding a job is hard because of the interview process if you are autistic because you can't you're not good at uh you're not good at sweet talking other people you're not good at at, at like just really boosting your own like ego when you're trying to convince people that you should hire me because i have these terrific skills you know you'll be missing out if you don't have me in your company we're just not good at those kinds of feels talks. it feels like a terrible activity like it just feels so unsafe like if someone was talking about themselves in this way i would yeah. feel so unsafe around them i don't want to do that to other people yeah. can you do that yeah yeah or, or interview yeah. questions that are so yep. open-ended you know tell me about yourself i remember as an 18 year old um you know like college kid i went on a job interview and they said so tell me about yourself and i'm like well, I was born in, you know, this place yeah. and I have a brother yeah. and like, yeah. I had no idea yeah. what they wanted to know. Exactly, exactly. So the interview process is difficult. And if you do land a job, then there's just a lot of workplace culture that for an autistic person is really difficult to to figure out, right? Because it's it's always changing and there the the sensory component of it we also don't know until we experience it like lunchtime and needing that alone time and 
being perceived as standoffish because you don't want to go to lunch with people or just uh, when people bring their own lunch, like the smell of it. And how do you correct that, right? Or I mean, I'm sensitive to deodorant and like perfume. Like how can you ask a coworker, oh, I'm really, you, you stink, I like you stink, you, can you please don't wear that? It's just a lot of these things, I think, uh, especially I when you're through. a woman, when you're a woman, you are not expected to speak like that, to critique or, you know, I just, it's just hard to navigate. Yeah, set that. boundaries. You're not, you're not accepted yeah. to set yeah. you're not, it's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not acceptable. One of the things that struck me when we were like organizing our brands before we started was the idea of like, yeah, employment sucks. And it's also, it sucks like around the world. And so you were, you were, I, I think you were maybe yeah. going to bring up something about the experience of, of, of being unemployed in Asia and how that, what that is like and how that compares. Yeah. Well, um, being employed in a, in an Asian country where Nordavijan people are, it's everything is still, of course, on um, based on a deficit model, right? So you are not even accepted within your family, and in Asia, you do what your parents want you to do, basically. <laughs> There's no meeting in the middle, right? So you're expected to to uh, plan your career as your parents see you do it. You know, so it's it is still real. Like if if you know your dad is a doctor, then you're expected to be a doctor and so on, right? And any deviation of that will be very very stressful. So it, when you are autistic in an Asian country, and I was born and raised in, in Indonesia, so I know that many of, I know s some autistic young people there, and we're, they're all in hiding together. I guess it's better than hiding alone, <laughs> right? But we have these small cohorts, and we try to support each other, but we can't even uh, team up to form a nonprofit for autistic people because on paper we're not able to be able to put down i'm the pre I'm, I'm the founder i'm autistic and so on you know so that's that's a problem and um it's it's um and if you have to always hide whether you're you know in college or you're you're looking for a job or it's it doesn't matter how brilliant your mind is everything's just going to fall apart you know because you can't self-advocate so that's how it is in countries outside of um, america in asia where at least now with social media and you know all these small pockets of autistic people grouping together we can learn um, what being autistic means together, because right. Right. outside of these pockets, there's really, they don't talk about it. What they write about it on newspapers and magazines and every April, but other than that, it's, it's not happening. Right. Right. So, so not only do you have the experience of isolation, um, and, yeah. you know, being, and, and, and the shame that being kept like, you know, right. hidden away because your family's right. embarrassed of you, but you are, you don't have the opportunity to learn about your strengths. You don't have the opportunity to, you know, learn about autistic culture. I think autistic culture, uh, in Asia, it's very different than autistic culture in the Western countries. Uh, we are very privileged to be here that when we can do podcasts and um, actually be able to openly say I'm autistic without having to be kick, get kicked out of the house because that's what happens in my country. If you, if, you know, your family uh, catches you like doing an, a podcast they'll kick you out of the house and in asia it's very common that young people live with their parents until their 20s and 30s uh newly married couple still lives with the in-laws which is like that would be like 
that's all going to work for me, but that's how it is over there, right? Yeah. So lots of layers of complexity, I think. Absolutely. And, and and as we like connect this back to work, I mean, here you told the story of, you know, when 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 being, you know, work, work your work drove you into burnout and you figured yeah. out you had to start your yeah. own thing. And yeah. it sounds like, you know, you couldn't have done that in Indonesia. No, I I would would be I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be doing all this work uh, at my age, um, but I know that I'm here for a reason. If I I think about all the time what kind of person I would be if I had gone home and live in Indonesia, I think I would be a very, very different person. You know, I don't know. Maybe I'll kick ass in a different way. <laughs> maybe, maybe, right? Because it's in my gene. Um, maybe I would become a rebel in a different way. That would be cool too. Uh, but, um, yeah, what was your question? Did you, did yeah. I answer your question? Yeah, you, you totally answered my question. You totally did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so now you're in this, this, this place where you are doing consultations and trainings. You are trying to support, uh, you know, a wide range of autistic people in accessing mm -hmm. employment, um, yeah. you know, can we talk a little bit about some of the challenges, particularly as it relates to, because we, you know, we talked about executive functioning and paperwork right. and you know, culture and, you know, all this, but like the specific challenges of communication. Can we talk a yeah. little bit about that? Yeah, so it's very interesting. I think over 80% of human communication involves uh, nonverbal communication channels, right? So we have quite a few. We have our facial expression, use of eye gaze, as well as eye gaze aversion, vocal inflections. We use like hand gestures, body orientation, you know, body language as we know it. Um, uh, and we communicate our intentions using those channels that I just listed. And only 20% is using our mouth words, so spoken words or verbals. Uh, but it's very interesting that if you are autistic and people know that you're autistic, um, you know, you, you get ding for not using eye contact when we have to avert our gaze, but not neurotypical people also avert uh, their gazes too when they have to process information or when they're thinking or they don't feel comfortable, they also avert their eye contact. I hate the word, I use the word eye contact, you know. So using or not using eye contact is part of meaningful human communication. But uh, for neurodivergent people, um, we get criticized a lot by our uh, communication expressions, you know. So for autistic people, when our bandwidth is low, we're going to rely on more so on our nonverbal communication channels, right? That's just natural. But um, I, that's the unfortunate situation, I think, for autistic uh, employees working, um, or if you run a business uh, as an autistic person and you're trying to sell your product, you know, where you're meeting somebody on Zoom and trying to do your pitch, you know, we, the, the eye contact is a big thing and the, how much we need to fidget and move. And when we're nervous, we're going to move, like do stuff with our hands or move and, you know, we get ding for that, <laughs> you know, and, um, it, 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 I wish that every autistic person can say, hello, my name is Macy and I'm autistic. And there you go. Everything will be uh, smoother because you're you're just being open from the get go. But we know most of the time autistic people can't do that. Right. So I think uh, people forget that the communication is a basic human right in any form, in any form. And um, yeah, if you communicate through texting or an AAC device, it's just as good as 
mouth words. It's not less, it's just as good and even more important for some people, right? Because that's their only method of communication is through text or visual based communication. So um, I hope that someday we can change the way we expect uh, people, neurodivergent people use communication, that needs to change. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, e even when someone is um, a speaking communicator, even a speaking communicator, most of the time, um, often use of mouth words comes at a cost, like a, a significant right. drain of bandwidth since of, 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 because of how complex right. a motor skill spoken speech yeah. is. And yeah. um, you know, I, I, I even find that a lot of a lot of my patients who would identify as speaking communicators, they often lose access to mouth words. They haven't had a yeah. it's been that way their whole lives. They haven't had a framework for understanding yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So we have people, yeah. you know, in their 30s, 40s, um, older, um, you right. know, accessing AAC devices for the first time. Yeah, and isn't it? That's yeah. That's yeah. even more so in Asia. I mean, the the access is it doesn't happen at all. <laughs> you know, if you you yeah. The, the other thing, the flip side is 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 true. You know, in in the United States, at least in like the the healthcare settings that I have yeah. worked in, mm -hmm. um, you know, it is not uncommon to mm -hmm. meet someone who is a non speaking communicator. Who has not been afforded access to AAC, despite, as right. you said, communication is a human right. And so, yeah. you know, people are like prescribed these like sedating medications because mm -hmm. they're so dysregulated. Right. How could you not be if no one has right. afforded you right. access to yeah. communicate? Yeah, because the gold standard is still speaking through mouth words. I think globally, that's yeah. I mean, uh, and and I think I wish that all autistic kids. Uh, are given uh, like all kinds of methods and practice to communicate, you know, and and all those channels are valid. It will be so much easier for autistic kids to grow up knowing, you know, in this situation when I, I have to go to like a party, I, I still would like to go to a party, but um, uh, you know, I can, when I can't talk, I can show this picture, you know, I need to go back to the car, something like that, you know, so oh, it'll be so much easier. Um, but that's, that's not happening yet. Right. We have to just normalize yeah. that there's no right way to communicate. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, my, my, my child, I have an autistic seven-year-old, mm -hmm. um, who was a non-speaking communicator till probably close to four. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we started low tech AAC with pictures mm -hmm. and pointing yeah. to things when they were, you know, two, maybe, yeah. maybe younger than right. that. Anyway, um, and, but, uh, but, but, but when they would go to school, um, we mm -hmm. had a watch. It only, it wasn't robust, like full yeah. AAC. Yeah. But, you know, it was, it was a watch with yes, no, and I need a minute. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that was like huge. That was absolutely huge. Yeah. Um, because, yeah. Yeah. you know some, something to communicate but anyway um how do you think that or how have you seen this play out when we have you know full-time or part-time aac users how how does how, what happens in employment spaces well i think that uh i think we can help uh, workplaces if we can help workplaces to learn from neurodivergent people and learn about all these different methods and strategy communication strategies and really honor um as you know what the person can do uh, in the moment and it also works both ways it's true with the double empathy theory with dr damien milton's double empathy theory like neurotypical uh, allies at work, they don't think of themselves as also uh, as a human being with a sensory perception and sensory differences, right? They don't think about it. Autistic people have to think about it because that's how we we make 
we make it try to make it through the day uh hopefully that's the situation sort of fake it till you can't handle it anymore um but i think if that's where autism care pathways my nonprofit we really want to educate workplaces and helping them to really learn about themselves learn about their own neurotypes sensory profiles and how they can support um, autistic people and autistic co-workers, right? So when we think about communication at work and really what we need is clarity. And if you think about badges, you know, I think it would be great to have um, badges or something uh, on your desk that communicates, this is how I feel today and I can't talk to you. Can you just email me? Like badges, right? And neurotypical oh. allies can do that too. Like, yeah. Yeah, I'm it, going it, on vacation, or I just got, got back from vacation, so I'm behind. <laughs> you know, talk to me tomorrow. Something right. like that. I'm not available. Yeah, yeah. dry erase board would work. Yeah, I love. I know. I love that. I mean, so the these strategies um, benefit everybody. Um, Correct. You, you, Right. And, and ju just as, you know, I think that lots of non-autistic people would acknowledge that there are times where sending an email or sending a text message is yeah. how they best communicate, right? So, like, that's yeah. AAC, right. and they don't realize, so, like, what do you mean I'm an AAC user? Yeah, you're an AAC user part-time. Yeah, emailing, email is a of a text-based communication. So, uh, there is one thing that's different, though, is neurotypical pace and neurodivergent pace, definitely our pace tend to be slower because we just have lower bandwidth to begin with each day, you know, but in terms of clarity on like how fast or when we are expected to meet the due dates, it's just about making it clear both ways so we can adjust each other's pace accordingly. So I would say communication, and pace, those are the two that we have to keep in mind. Um, and other than that, I think uh, respecting when someone is uh, communication as part of their self-advocacy, you know, um, we shouldn't shame people for asking for help or, ha or having a mental health break day, you know, we shouldn't shame them, right? Right, it's a, it's, it's a huge, um, you know, there's so many, there's so many things that are broken about, like, mm -hmm. just like culturally broken and this whole yeah. business about, you know, shaming people for yeah. advocating, shaming yeah. people for, you know, asserting what their access needs are, taking a mm -hmm. break, asking for help, all these things. And like the overly glorif the over glorification of independence, um, yeah. it's just, it's a real yeah. problem. Yeah. And I mean, for every workplace, usually you already have uh, a access point, you know, to good things like sensory movement breaks uh, or the standing tables. It's if you're in the Bay Area, those are all available. Uh, Microsoft, Google has nap pods, for example. Facebook has those open air like uh, garden on the their rooftop, you know, and those are, no one is saying these are great uh, things for uh, available for autistic uh, employees, but they're good for everyone. Yeah, right? for sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just looking at our, our list. So is there, is there any, we, 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 we talked about just quality of life and, and mm -hmm. human rights. Is there anything you want to like circle back around to that about yeah. that topic? I think that in terms of supporting employment for autistic people and especially autistic people who have to run their own business uh, or running a um, social enterprise, I think if I think we need to figure out how to educate the community at large people outside of the autism and autistic community, because otherwise it's really hard to survive and pay the bill, pay bills, just selling stuff. It's not enough, you know, so you're always living in poverty 
because uh, you can't make too much money. You only can make this much money or you lose your benefit, social security, you know, your SSI benefit. Um, so I think that's something I haven't figured out how we can educate faster, <laughs> like everyone. I mean, you and I are within these small circle and we, it's like a, it's a tight, we're tight and we support each other. But in general though, people don't know much or don't think about like the small business they owners, don't they don't think about hiring um, autistic people at all. They worry about taxes. We, they worry about parking situation. They worry about all this stuff, how to run their business, you know, because, uh, yeah. Uh, so that, that I think, is uh, a big problem. You know, we have a new program at All Brings Belong where we are supporting um, our neurodivergent patients who mm -hmm. have who've been thwarted by you know all this all the broken systems we're helping them start small businesses mm -hmm. and it's 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 interesting to you know you you were saying that you and I think in bullet points like thinking about like what are the bullet points to running yeah. a bit because you don't have to go at it alone as long as you know what your resources are right. and you know where the little pockets, the little gems of resources that you can access affordably. Yeah. And because it takes so much, like I remember when I was starting off, like I never thought I'd be like a person to run a thing. Like I have no executive functioning skills yeah. like at all. Um, so I like never thought this, but then I like was deep in burnout and like I couldn't do it anymore. Like I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. anyway. So it was a, it was a safety thing. So um Anyway, it was like the executive functioning required to access the resources, but then once I found them, it was yeah. okay. And so, you know, for it, or there, there are, you know, in, in, in Vermont, um, in New England, there's an organization called the Center for Women in Enterprise where they for sliding yeah. scale, including for $0. I love it. You can, yeah. you know, participate in all these workshops. And like, that's how right. I learned how to like set up like accounting. Like I'm, I, I also have this yeah. go-to. It's a yeah. freaking nightmare to do anything with numbers yeah. anyway. But, um, you know, like following along with other people yeah. kind of make yeah. it okay. And the shame, like the, the shifting, the narrative to like, there are still times yeah. where something will happen and I'll be like, I'm yeah. supposed to know how to do this. If we can just sort of like right. normalize that, like, no, you're not supposed to know how to do this. Lots of people don't know how to do this. We're going to figure right. it out together. That's, right. that's the idea. So these people are like a cohort of autistic people starting small businesses together because, you know, autonomy is an access need. Um, and, and, you know, for those of us with chronic illness, fluctuating capacity. Today I can do the thing. Later today I can't do the thing. I'm out of spoons. Right. I'm... You know, I'm, I'm, I I post exertional malaise, I crash, you know, I need to be right. able to have that kind of flexibility in a way that, right. you know, right. most employment settings don't afford. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, there are different kinds of employment. And I think it would be great if uh, autistic kids and their caregivers learn um you know, in growth mindset mode instead of deficit mindset, because if, if all you know is all based on fix it mindset, then you have all this million pieces, little pieces that are not even connecting to uh, make the the picture, the big picture that the, the autistic person um, visualize, right? So that's the problem <laughs> that we have today. We have very capable, talented, autistic job seekers, but they're still, they're still going through that, uh, trial and error at that age, right? Uh, I, I believe I, I, I was a late bloomer. Um, there's still many, many, autistic job seekers who are still doing that trial and error, right? It will be so much easier if we could just shift from a deficit mindset earlier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And if we can recognize kind of like you were you at the very beginning when you were talking about how if you can find employment that is connected to your interests, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Correct. We're mono. We have monotropic brains. Of course, yeah. that's going to be how it's going to work. So if we can right. not only have a strengths-based lens, what am I good at? But what do I love? 
and that can change yep. and so your work can change and that's okay but mm -hmm. you know the idea the idea of looking for work that's you know not connected to anything that gives you dopamine is just it's mm -hmm. it's it's from a quality of life standpoint i think that's an important consideration yeah yeah i mean autistic people are of course interest centered that is true 100 percent and that interest is the tabletop it's what drives us and uh keeps us going and everything else the support has to go with that tab tabletop right so again, but if 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 those uh, autistic interests are being cultivated and nurtured uh, as early as possible, instead of being redirected <laughs> into more right, because that's not normal. Typical, yeah. exactly, exactly, because you know our our, our special interests, whether it's uh, movement based or character based or activity based, whatever, we have. Uh, a very good reason why we like it actually gives people around us clues important clues yes. right but no one's looking for the clues that's the problem they don't care they've got their yeah. their blinders on yeah um, we yeah were looking yeah. for office buildings um at all brains belong um we we had a building inspector come in and uh after you know he, he did, you know the guy did his thing um he mm. info dumped for I'm not kidding, 45 minutes only he was talking. We're all standing yeah. around and he's info dumping about the pipes and the bricks. Yeah, exactly. And the this and the, and, the goal. Exactly. and I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta follow your passion. I think that's true for neurotypical and neurodivergent people. Right? But for, for autistic job seekers, they don't even know. I mean, those uh, specific interests and passions, they were just buried because they were told uh, not to do them or who would want to pay for this? You know, that's yeah. a sad thing. Yeah, yeah and they, a real they, job. They, yeah, and as you know, many of them uh, went to school and have different types of certificates and trainings and degrees, but they still can't get a job or they're underemployed. Why, right? Right. And because, um, you know, we have an incredibly ableist society that, yeah. um, you know, where people grow up being told there's one correct way to do the thing. And that's what employers are generally expecting. The, they have the sense for the one weird way to, to do the thing and they meet the people yeah. and they're considering yeah. how close they match to the one right way yeah. to do the thing. Yeah. You know, and yeah. people get passed over yeah yeah well if you disclose as autistic then basically you have the boxes that the company has prepared based on their knowledge of autistic uh, job seekers they expect you to fit into those boxes right we're actually if you do that then the world is missing out because we're so much more <laughs> than yes. just these boxes create that it's just based on um myths about autistic people um i i like it the other way around customized employment so oh i just finished i'm an, a nationally accredited customized employment specialist actually cool. I know. Talking, I just That's finished awesome. that. Yeah. So, so I, I, I can somehow convince companies and businesses to uh, get rid of those boxes because autistic people are are here to unbox because that's just how we can innovate and um, create and you know we would be uh, it would be we would become more valuable to the companies if we can show totally. them yeah unbox totally yeah right right and so it's the it's it's the idea of you know the the wider lens of creating a socially yeah. just 
world where people get their basic needs met, they have access to the things they need, they're part of mm -hmm. community yeah. where they can show up right. authentically, like all, all, all of this, right? Like it just yeah. takes this wider view. It's more than here's yeah. how to, you know, have autistic people do things. It's like, how do, do we, all get, our, yeah. how do we all get our needs yeah. met? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think human beings are all, we're all three dimensional it being, we're being perceived as, you know, human beings first, autistic or not, it would be so much better because that way we can, we can match talents, not just the skills, <laughs> talents, aptitudes, interests, you know, um, not just the skills. I think matching autistic skills to the boxes are so, so I mean, it's yeah. tragic, I think. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Then we're just going to have autistic people working at the corner in a big company. Right, right. It's 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 marginalization. You might have a job, right. but you're it's like you at school, you went to school, but they're right. like, go sit in the corner where you don't have to sit and right. stand and don't do right. math, right? Like it's you're not you're not yeah. included you're not included you don't feel right. like you belong right yeah and and autistic people who are in that position they're probably thinking oh i'm so lucky that i got that i got this job you know because they're not thinking about possibilities either if if in general people don't think of you as uh in terms it's of capable. possibilities yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. You're not capable. Yeah. This is all you're going to amount to. Yeah. Um, you know, that's just so short sighted. And so much of, you know, so much even of, of people who are identified as autistic earlier in life, um, you know, in the United States that are, you know, in public school with an IEP yeah. and like not that everyone has to go to college. I'm not saying that, but it's, yeah. a, it's an idea of like you're not you're you're like in this path where we're going to like teach you. How to yeah, walk yeah, table. yeah. Like really yeah. Like the table. That's all you got. Yeah. And it's very sad because your we're your your career trajectory uh, has always been decided by people, other people, but yourself. Yeah. So you're afforded only specific type of learning or subjects based how on how other people see you, right? Yes. Yes. And yes. how and, and because of that, that shapes your own experiences of how you come to see yourself. Right. Um, and and because how could it not? And which is why, like, yeah. part of the healing process is yeah. of coming together in community yeah. of other people working mm -hmm. on shifting that narrative together, because when Correct. you have your experiences reflecting back to you through the stories of other people. Not only do you feel less alone, but uh -huh. you're like, oh, oh, oh I, I actually have something to offer. I have something to offer that is valued by other right. people. I didn't know that. They didn't tell yeah. me that. They yeah. Didn't like yeah. People. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. Your vocabulary, your self advocacy vocabulary is mostly based on what other people uh, talk to you about. That's the sad thing. I mean, you you you're worth much more than that, right? But it's I I see that a lot. Like I could I could I talk to young autistic people, and I could hear that the way they describe themselves are not actually true, because yeah, that's absolutely. what they believe. They've been told by other people. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about before we wrap up? No, no, no. I just uh, I appreciate your time, and I think this was a good talk. And we this should definitely talk. we should definitely collaborate. You know, let me know how I can support uh, all brains belong, and because uh, together we're hopefully faster. <laughs> change the world. <laughs>
and we look forward to hold on a second i can stop sharing there we go where's my there we go thank you all so much for being here with us tonight and uh sorry to keep you a, a few minutes longer um but uh and we are so grateful to Maisie for being uh, with us asynchronously today. And we look forward to seeing you all next week um, where we will um, have our monthly book chat. Book chat um, this month will be uh, featuring the book Sincerely Your Autistic Child, um, which is um, a really, uh, probably one of the most powerful books I've read in a very, very long time. And uh, as always for book chat, never any pressure to read the book. Most people will not have read the book. We have us, uh, our staff has plucked out our favorite passages and we'll review them together and have some conversation. So thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks for being part of our community. Have a good night.